There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. There ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. And fear is a liar with a smooth and velvet tongue. Fear is a tyrant, he's always telling me to run. Love is a resurrection, love is a trumpet sound. Love is my weapon, I'm gonna take my giants down. Ain't no my body down yesterday we finished right at the end of section four <clears throat> should have finished section six didn't get quite that far we're gonna pick up right here and we're gonna move right on in to section five <clears throat> yesterday we were talking about why Jesus healed we showed you over and over again the only thing now listen carefully the only thing, that's on page 37 is where I'm going to start. The only reason ever given for Jesus healing anyone is compassion. Do you get that? <clears throat> not because he was led to. <clears throat> not because there was an anointing. Not because there was a, not because there was a word. Right? It doesn't even say he, had, he received a word from God. To heal that person. It always says he was moved with compassion. You got that? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't led by the Spirit. Obviously he was. He was the Son of God. The Holy Spirit's always in there. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit's always leading. We're just not always obeying. Yeah. Right? If you see a sick person, well, let me put it this way. Even if you don't see a sick person, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit knows they're there. And he will automatically start pulling in that direction and try to get your attention on that person because he expects once your attention has been drawn to that person that you will do something. Right? He doesn't show you someone. When I first started, there were certain things. And we talk about you know, feelings and that kind of stuff. And, and, and there's a lot of really great questions you guys are asking. I'd love to get, or asking, I'd love to get into, directly into them just doing, but we'd be here all day just doing questions uh, because there are some really good things. Now, one that you mentioned was uh, if everything was done 2,000 years ago and it's considered done by God, why, whenever Angelo was raised, why did I have to uh, get vocal with God in the elevator? Okay? Now, here, here's what you have to realize. <clears throat> God's always ready. He's always on. He's always ready to heal. He's always ready to, to, to deliver. He, he's always on. Okay? Now, for us as humans... Usually, we have to rise to a level where we're on. The key is, okay, you ever hear somebody say, well, man, that person, they just push my buttons. I'm telling you, they just push my buttons. I mean, they can say something, and I'm right there, all right? And what that means is they can do something that causes you instantly to rise to a level of defense or whatever it is against them, right? <clears throat> and it's exactly the same thing in ministering to the sick that most of the time, people have to rise to a level where they will do something. So the real key is not always looking for ways to rise. The key is to get your level of action lowered to where you will act instantly without any provocation. Right? See, most people, well, I'm, I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit to lead me. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says if you're a son of God, son or daughter of God, you are led, right? And you think you're, being, you're waiting on God to lead you, and God is waiting on you to be obedient, right? The Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. It does not say he will lead and guide you into action. 
See? If, if he led you into action, meaning that he moves you in the sense that he does, most people want to be walking through Walmart, pushing the little cart, and they want God to take their hand and throw it over on somebody and go, oh, I guess God wants me to pray for you. That's not how God, that's not what God wants. God wants a person working in conjunction with them, wanting to do the will of God. And so the key is to lower the level at which we will react. You ever see some people that, I mean, you can get in their face, scream, yell, all this stuff, and they're just standing there just look at you. Yeah. Actually, we kind of see that on the news recently. <laughs> they're standing there and look, not doing anything, not, you, know, you know what I mean, just not, not hitting or responding, put it that way. <clears throat> and then you have some people that if you look at them wrong, what, 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 what are you looking at? I mean, they're just, they're right there, right? Why? Because their response mechanism is that short. So we want our response mechanism to the needs of people and to the Spirit of God to be that short. Amen? What does that mean? That means we need to be sensitive to the needs of people and to the will of God. So when we see something, see, if you see a sick person, there is no reason why God should have to tell you to go do what he's already told you to do. Amen. He's already told you in the word, believers will lay hands on the sick. Right. He does not say, at my unctioning. Right. You get that? Yeah. So if we're going to be believers, then we have to be open and ready. Yeah, right? When I first... now. Understand, and you have to understand, when I first started, I didn't know all this stuff. And back then, everything was, you can't move without a leading. You know, you can't just go out and witness. you got to be led. And you got to be led on who to go witness to. And pray for somebody. Oh, man, you got to definitely have a leading, uh, you know, a prophetic word, and then, you know, a word of knowledge when you get there, and you got to be anointed. I mean, it made it impossible. And everybody just kind of, well, it's too intricate, you know, too complicated. So I'm just going to do nothing, which is the worst thing you can do, right? It's better to make a mistake than to do nothing. Because at least if you make a mistake, God can fix the mistake. God can't fix you doing nothing, right? So when I first started, I didn't know all this stuff. And so I, and I'd heard everything. I'd heard, you know, don't move, don't do anything, don't act until you hear from God, don't do anything until you get going, uh, you know, until God moves on you, or some, all this stuff. And then, even then, they say, okay, how do I know when God's moving on me? How do I know it's just not me, right? I mean, all those things, the things we talk about are all things I went through. And so, at that time, uh, and, and like I said, I was, I'm, I've always been pretty introverted, you know, to a large degree, just, you know, a private person, more or less, and I don't like to, you know, push something on somebody, which was a lot of times what's what the devil will tell you, you're trying to push your religion on somebody. No, I'm trying to push freedom. Yeah. I'm trying to set them free, right? I'm not trying to get them to even necessarily believe anything, even though I would love for them to believe something. And so, in the beginning, I told God, I want to be used. And it was amazing because at that time I was praying in tongues a lot, I was doing everything I knew to do, and we would go to, at that time my kids were still living at home, they were fairly small, and so we would go to a place like, uh, you know, Golden Corral or something like that, you know, where you, all you can eat, I mean, that's, if you got a bunch of kids, that's where you go, right? You just, <laughs> you go there, and, you know, we used to, you know, we used to call it the Golden Trough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'll tell you, I hated eating there. I, I hated it. I, I don't eat corn, and I especially don't like corn in my mashed potatoes. And if you go to Places like that, there's going to be corn in your mashed potatoes because people use the same spoon for everything. And you see it all, I'm like, no, nah, no, thank you. And so, but I would go there and I would be eating, just eating a meal with my family, not thinking anything in particular, just, you know, eating, maybe praying in tongues under my breath while I'm eating or something like that because I was praying in tongues a lot. And I will tell you, almost all of the major miracles, either miracles of healing or even miracles in my life of God protecting me, almost every one of those followed a period of praying in tongues for an extended period of time. Almost every one. Uh, <clears throat> fell three stories on a scaffold, landed on my feet, 
didn't even know I had fallen when I got there. Everybody started running around. And the whole day, I'd been praying in tongues, right? And the whole scaffolding fell, fell around me. And I, I just, one minute I'm facing the wall, the next minute I'm on the ground facing the opposite direction. have no idea how I turned around. But I'm just standing there, right? And everybody starts running around. Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, you know, and just, but I've been praying in tongues. And I've been witnessing to our crew. Me and another young man were there. We'd been, we both prayed in tongues. And they would hear us. We'd been witnessing to the crew we were working with. And this was definitely a sign. Matter of fact, shortly after that, several of them got born again. <laughs> right? Because we saw, and I can tell you, time after time, uh, praying in tongues for an extended period of time, almost every, and, and the thing is, sometimes I start it. Other times I feel an unction to start. Either way, doesn't matter. And it's like Wigglesworth said, if the spirit doesn't move me, I move the spirit. Right? So if I don't feel the need, you know, if I don't feel an unction, as we would say, to pray in tongues, I'll just pray in tongues. I just start. <clears throat> and, well, this is in the seminar on tongues necessarily, but still. Um, <clears throat> but I would go to the, to the Golden Crowd or something like that. And I, the reason I'm saying that is because I'm picturing particular times that happen. And I'd be sitting there eating, just trying to eat. And all of a sudden, I just start crying for no reason. And people, my wife would look at me, what's the matter? I'm like, I don't know. And I'd just sit there and just cry and try to eat. And then I started realizing every time I started crying, I started looking around, and there'd be somebody sick coming near me. <clears throat> and, and so then it got to where if I started crying, I immediately, who is it? Which one? Who? You know, what's going on? And invariably, there'd be something, and most of the time, there's something I could see but I would not have noticed, and it might be somebody across the room or something that I hadn't noticed until I started crying. Now, understand, I'm not saying I had to cry, but at that time, I was learning, growing. I hadn't been taught to look without an unction. I was taught to have that unction first or have a leading or something. And so I wasn't taught to just walk into a room and look for the sick person and then be able to go to them. See, that was, you didn't do that back then. And so... And, you know, because, I mean, they had to have their own faith and they had to be able to believe and that means I'm going to have to go witness to them and I'm going to have to get them to a point where they have faith in God and they're probably an unbeliever and i got to get them all the way from unbeliever to actual faith in God for healing. <laughs> See? So, which, you know, is why most people that believe you have, to, that every person has to have their own faith, it's why the people that believe that don't witness. And they only use their faith on themselves. And whenever you use faith on yourself, you know, after you get well, what else is there to do but go after things? And then pretty soon you just you think your faith is evidence by how much of you, stuff you have that you can say, see what my faith got me? Instead of people. People are trophies to God. <clears throat> your faith will bring people to God as trophies. Healings, even if they don't get born again. Th them getting born again after they get healed is none of your business. I mean, now understand, you want to witness. You should never witness. You should never minister healing without witnessing to them who healed them and what, how, what their response should be. Right? It's not right just to go around healing and then, you know, write it down and put another notch, you know, in your belt, so to speak, and just say, oh, here's how many people we got healed today. Right? Because why would you want people to go to hell with a well body? <laughs> right? So you, it's important. You get them well, tell them why. Get them born again. Now, you can't make them get born again. Right? That's a, cho that's a matter of choice of their will. And that's the difference. See, a lot of people think that healing... A person has to have their own faith, and they see healing and salvation as equal, and there are equal parts to it, but they see it as the same, and it was paid for at the same time, but it is different. <clears throat> because the Bible says very clearly that, I, that even in Genesis, that man was given dominion over all the earth and everything that, you know, basically walked, crawled, and swam, and flew, and all that. And the only thing that man was not given dominion over was other people. <clears throat> so... Now, that also means that if there are demons, demons walk, crawl, fly, swim, whatever it is, they do. Now, and so we have authority over it. Jesus gave us authority over demon, demonic spirits, right? He gave us authority over sickness and disease. So we, I have authority over that. Now, I have authority over it, whether it's in my body or your body. See? Whether you, if it's in your body, I still have authority over that sickness or over that demon. Just because it's in your body doesn't mean I lose authority over that, yeah. right? And so I can speak to that thing in your body, and even if you want to keep it, it has to obey me. Now, if you want it, you can get it back, <laughs> right? 
And if it comes back, it's going to bring seven more worse than itself. That's exactly what's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> but many people saw healing and salvation as the same, and they would say, well, we can't get people, we can't make people get saved. They have to have their own faith to get saved, so they have to have their own faith to get healed. So we can't make people get healed. No, there's a difference. I don't have authority over your will. See, salvation has to do with an act of your will submitting to God. <clears throat> healing has to do with a demon or a sickness submitting to the authority of God that is in me. Right? See, God gave me. See, we have, I, Jesus and I have an agreement. He said, if I'm connected to him, I can ask whatever I want and he'll give it. Now, he also said that if I'm connected to him, believe in him, I can lay hands on the sick and the, and the sick will recover. That's between me and God. That's not between me and you. You see? So if I lay hands on the sick, you're just a sick, but the agreement between me and Jesus is if I lay hands on the sick, they're going to get well. It has nothing to do with that person. I don't care where their faith is. I don't care what they believe. don't care if they're breathing. don't care if they're dead. None of that matters. Why? Because we have an agreement. Amen. Now, if I believe that your faith is involved, then I have diluted that, and now I'm going to have to get you to believe. So, but now if I'm going to get you saved, now that's not the same. I can't command you to get saved because that's an act of your will, and it's an ongoing act of your will. But I can get you healed. I can get that sickness or disease or demon. They will obey and they will go. So I can get you healed whether you like it or not. Okay? Whether you want. I've had people say, would you pray for me? But don't let it take effect until after I get recertified for my disability. <laughs> not kidding. Right? I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to put, you know, time release healing in you. Okay? We're not going to do that. <laughs> So we so I don't for you to get saved it's an act of your will and I have no authority over that other than to convince you why you should submit to Jesus right that's why they many times call it soul winning why cuz I'm not winning your spirit I'm winning your soul and by an act of your soul making a decision your spirit you're allowing God to come into your spirit and give your spirit life Right? So I have to convince your soul, not your spirit. God's already working on you, you know, in the spirit realm. People say, well, if somebody isn't born again, they can't hear God. Then how would you get born again? Yeah. See, before you got born again, you heard God drawing you, and you heard him through his word or through somebody preaching. So sinners can hear God. All through the Old Testament, you see people, kings, right? Abimelech yep. heard God. God said, you're a dead man, <laughs> right? And he's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, All right? God was talking. So just if we, we act as though we're the only people that can hear God. No, we're not the only people that can hear God. But we are people who have heard God and decided to obey him. Amen. Right? So I can, I can convince you to get saved maybe, but I can make you get healed. Now, I can't make you stay healed. Right? Because whatever you were doing before, if you keep doing it, you're probably going to get sick again. Right? And it won't take near as long the second time for you to get sick as it did the first time. Because it'll come back seven times more, right? So anyway, <clears throat> all that goes back. I don't know necessarily why we get into that, except over the yoga stuff. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> kind of led down that path. But we talk about several different reasons. Every time, it, that's what it was. Every time it says why Jesus healed, it says he was moved with compassion. Every time. It never says he was led, right? And I've heard people talk about different things. Oh, the pool of Bethesda. And I've heard preachers talk about the pool of Bethesda. How Jesus went there, and there was a great multitude of people, and Jesus stepped over this sick person, stepped around that sick person, ignored this sick person, just to get to that one person. And there is nothing in the Bible that says that. Nothing that says that. And people say, well, why, why did only one person get healed there? Well, it technically doesn't say only one got healed. It, it just highlights one case. Right? Now, we do know he had to get away from there pretty quick because two things. The religious people were going to stone him and kill him because of it. And the people he was getting healed wanted to name him king. And he had to get away from that or they would have drafted him into being king. And then things wouldn't have went the way they were supposed to go. So there were certain times that he had to pull back. But it's amazing to me because uh, everything that it actually says that people use about that verse, we'll look at it a little bit later on. But everything everybody says about that and preaches about it, if you read the scripture itself, it says exactly the opposite. 
almost every case where people try to prove that God won't heal or chooses who to heal or something like that, every time, if you read the scripture they bring up, it actually proves the opposite of what they say. Right? I will show you that in just a minute, as a matter of fact. Now, uh, here on Luke 7, uh, yeah, page 37, Luke chapter 7, verse 11, it says, And it came to pass a day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came near to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, who did he see? Her. her okay. He had compassion on her, not on the dead guy. Do you get that? He had compassion on the mother, on the woman. And he said unto her, weep not. So we know she was crying. And he said, stop it. Don't weep, right? Now watch. And he came and touched, this would be a casket, what we would think of as a casket. And he, so he came and touched the casket, the thing that actually it would be like a little uh, stretcher. And they laid the body on it. And he came up. And yeah, here's these guys. You got to picture it because they, they usually carried it on their shoulders. Sometimes they would carry it behind them, but mostly on their shoulders. And so you got these guys, at least two, maybe four, depending on how big the thing was. But they would be carrying this thing. Jesus sees the woman, has compassion, and says, weep not, stop it, don't weep. Turns around and then touches the, the casket, the stretcher, the thing that the man is on. Doesn't even say it touched the man. Touched the thing that he was carried on, okay? Now watch this. And they that bear him stood still. So as soon as he reached unto it, they just stopped, okay? <clears throat> and he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. Right? Now watch. He's talking to the dead man. He didn't say, heavenly father. Please, if it be thy will, raise that you see the mother. Look at her. Please raise it. He didn't say that. He turned around and said, don't weep. And he said, young man, I say unto you, arise. Right? Now watch this. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Now remember, the Bible only records what is vital. What it doesn't record here is, at this point, the other guys dropped him. I mean, I mean, think about that. Okay, now if you're at the guy at the back end and you're watching this, maybe you held on. But the guy up front that doesn't know what's going on, I guarantee he's like, what? and the guy set up and started talking, I guarantee you, he took off. So then the thing went like this, right? But he doesn't tell you all that. You say, how do you know that? Because I've been involved in situations like that. Just before Christmas, uh, several years ago, 2002, one, 2001, I think it was, yeah, many years ago now. <clears throat> I was on my way from meetings going to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, where we were, I'd been up there for about six weeks and teaching, and then I had to travel, and I was kind of, I think I might have been coming back from Texas, probably was, yeah, because I was coming up across uh, 30, I uh, went through Little Rock and then went on across, and I was coming into Memphis, and just before you cross the Mississippi, there's a, there's a West Memphis and there's Memphis, and just before you cross in there, there the highway is parted, and in the middle is a big, wide, open, median strip, but it's all grass, and it kind of goes down a little bit. And so I'm driving along, and I'm talking to my wife on the phone. It's just before Christmas, <clears throat> and I said, uh, it looks like there's something happened up front, up ahead of me. And she said, okay, well, I'll let you go, and I'll talk to you. I said, okay, so we hung up, and I pull up and there's cars along the side of the road, just a couple, but I noticed there was a truck on its side, a big box truck type of thing, over on its side, leaning into the middle where the gully is there. And so I pull off the side and I go up there and there's people standing around. I said, um, what's going on here? Ah, guy was driving a truck and had a heart attack. And I said, how is he? Oh, he's dead. I'm like, can I, can I see the body? <laughs> and the guy looks at me like, you're weird, <laughs> right? He said, yeah, I don't care. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, and it wasn't deep, but it was, you know, a little coating. And so I <clears throat> walked past, went by the truck, around the truck, where they had drug, they drug him out of the truck, 
put him on the ground, and they had covered him with a blue windbreaker. And so he's lying there, and his whole upper body is covered. And so I went up to him, and when I got up to him, I knelt down beside him. And it's funny, because I started talking about this. And these, tes these testimonies, when I talk about it, I relive them. And I can see it again. I can feel it again. And I remember going up, and I knelt down beside him. And I didn't think about it at the time, but as I knelt, I knelt on the snow, and my knees got wet and cold, right? And so I'm kneeling down, and my, the knees of my pants get wet. And so I'm kneeling down, and I take the blue windbreaker, and I pull it off him where I can see his face. Didn't know anything about this man, but as soon as I saw his face, all of a sudden, I got so mad. I mean, it just rose up inside of me. And I'm like, there is no way. I mean, I'm, it's like I'm talking, gritting my teeth, right? But I'm thinking. You ever, you ever think, gritting your teeth? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything at this point, but I'm thinking, there is no way Satan is going to steal this man and take him away from his wife and his two daughters right before Christmas. There is no way this is happening. I didn't know the man was married. I didn't know he had two daughters. Why did God tell me that? He wanted compassion stirred up. See, I didn't. Even, I wasn't even thinking about the man. I didn't think, oh, this poor guy. He's had, you know, heart attack. Oh, I didn't, I'm thinking about the wife and the daughters. I'm having compassion on them. That's why this story stood out to me. When I, started, when I read the Bible, things come out because I've experienced things similar. But it's been because I've been willing to step out and do things I didn't want to do, right? And so. I look at this guy, and I'm thinking, there's no way this is going to happen, and I get mad, but at the same time, so you have to realize compassion has two sides. One side is great compassion, which is love, and it's loving enough to do something, okay? Compassion isn't, oh, you poor thing, wish there was something I could do. No, that's sympathy, maybe even pity. Sympathy and pity doesn't heal, right? And so you have that, but then you start to move, you start to do something, and the other side of compassion can be an intense anger, right, against whatever caused that situation, okay? The Bible generally, or we refer to it oftentimes, as righteous indignation, right? And so I looked at this guy, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. Now, he's already dead, so what am I doing? I'm calling those things which be not as though they were, Amen. right? Amen. You will live and not die. And I just said it maybe two or three times. That's about it. 20 seconds. I get up, step back, turn to walk off, get about six, eight, ten steps away maybe, and all of a sudden I hear something that sounds like a belch. I mean, literally it's like, Bleh. I mean, it was like, you know, so I stop and turn around and look, and this guy lying down opens his eyes and starts raising his head up, moving his head around. Now, there was about ten, eight, ten, twelve people gathered around. As soon as he raised his head up and opened his eyes, <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody took off, right? I'm not kidding. Nobody ran to the guy. Nobody ran to the guy. Everybody ran the opposite direction. One guy that was near me, because I was near the truck, and this one guy ran past me, ran around the back of the truck, and was looking around the corner. And he was standing there, and he was saying, Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. That's all he said, right? And I kept, and, and it's funny because all, you know, because the situation, you don't dictate necessarily what you think in response to the just situation. It just kind of comes up. And I'm thinking, well, at least he knew who did it, <laughs> right? He wasn't back there saying, "Oh Buddha," you know, "Oh Muhammad," "Oh no," he wasn't doing that. He was, "Oh Lord Jesus," amen. And then after a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Then people started kind of coming back out and looking and talking and going over, and he's trying to move around a bit, but still kind of laying there. And he's moving around, and they're like, are you okay? And, they're talking. and by that time, one side, the police car came up, and another side, an ambulance came up from opposite directions. And the policeman gets out, and the, the ambulance uh, EMTs are getting out, and they're getting the stretcher out and going over. And the policeman comes over, all right, all right, everybody needs to clear out, unless your relatives are where you need to clear out and go there. And there was a woman there that she saw what happened. And she came to me, she goes, I saw that, <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay. And she said, uh, what are you doing? Because I, I needed to get on to Charlotte. And she said, I live in Memphis. And she said, I'm going to follow him to the hospital, and I'm going to find out details. And so we exchanged phone numbers, and she said, I'll, I'll be in touch with you and let you know what I find out. Well, 
it was a couple of days later, actually it was a little after Christmas when she finally called me. And she said that when he got there, she was able to get in and talk to him. And he, he said, I was dead. He said, I was dead and, I, and, and, and somehow I came back. Now he didn't, I, you know, she didn't give any details other than that. But then she said, but here's something I think you ought to know. She said, because the first day he was admitting he knew he was dead. But while she was there, people from his kingdom hall came in because he was a Jehovah's Witness. And they started talking to him, and they told him, you stop this nonsense. God did not raise you from the dead. You were not dead. And if you keep this up, you're going to be disfellowshipped or excommunicated. And so he stopped talking about it and told her, I, I, I don't know. And so he, she wrote me and she said, but here's the situation and here's what's going on now. <clears throat> and so in that, the only reason I told the story is because you have to realize that the compassion for the mother and daughter rose up. Why did God tell me? Because I needed that compassion at that moment. Why didn't God just raise him up? Because God doesn't just do that. He does that through people. He gave us the responsibility to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and the greatest responsibility, preach the gospel. Amen? So, now, so this compassion. Now, notice what it says. He had compassion on, on, the, on the woman. He said, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. Now, look. Now, you say, how do you know it was, uh, these guys got, you know, got afraid and dropped him and all that stuff? And there came a fear on all. There you go. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God has visited his people. All right? Now, so, how, again, now, so if you go back and read all these, blind eyes were opened because of compassion. Leprosy was healed because of compassion. The dead are raised because of compassion. Demons are cast out because of compassion. You get that? Men, uh, disciples were ordained into ministry because of compassion. See, you're not called to ministry because you're great and God needs you. You're called into ministry because the need is great and God needs to work through you to meet the needs. Right? And that's what you have to remember. Now, the problem is many times, here's what the devil does. At first off, when you first hear some things, usually he tries to stand in front of you, put his hand on your chest and go, whoa, 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 who do you think you are? You're not John Lake. You're not Smith Wigglesworth. You're not, who do you think you are? You can't do this. And then if you say, devil, get your hand off me. I'm doing this. It's my heritage. And you step into it, and then it starts working. Then the devil comes behind you, because he can't get in front of you and stop you. So he gets behind you, and he starts saying, oh, you're amazing. You're something. You're, you're special. You're, you're, you're highly anointed. You're, you're above average people. Because if he can't stop you by telling you you're nobody, he will stop you by telling you you're somebody. And you need to remember. Remember whenever Paul and Silas, when they came into town, or uh, Barnabas uh, came into town, what did they say? Oh, the gods have come down from heaven to speak to us. Guess where they were by evening? Hanging in a prison. Because the crowds changed from these are gods to these are troublemakers. Why? Because crowds are fickle. Never put your faith, your trust, your hope, or anything in the crowds. Your faith, hope, and trust is in God and God alone. If your faith is in people, they will always let you down, right? And you will be up and down based on where they are in their opinion of you. Amen. And that does not matter. What matters is what God thinks about you, Amen. right? Well, nobody likes me. Okay, well, first off, look and see why. <laughs> what are you doing? If all you're going to do is whine and cry and talk about how bad things are, I ain't going to like you either. I got to love you, but I ain't got to like you. And I don't have to hang around with you. Right? If you, the Bible says, if you're going to have friends, you've got to show yourself friendly. Well, that means if you're going to have people around you, you're going to have to have value in their life that makes them want to be around you. Amen? Amen. Nobody wants to hang around people that whine and cry, and, oh, it's bad, you don't understand, and, you know, nobody likes me. Well, change your words. Change your mouth. Encourage people. Tell them, we can do this. Right? And you watch. Encourage people. Don't worry about what you're doing or what you can't do. Encourage people to do what God has called them to do. Amen? So, now I'm going to have to stop here. <clears throat> so, uh, here in the last verse, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, 
who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Why did Jesus heal? Compassion. Okay, let me put it this way. People say, why are you always focused on healing? I'm not. People always ask me about healing, and I answer. I'm not focused on healing. I'm focused on who I am in Christ and who he is in me. But people always ask me about healing, right? But if you, if you wanted to say, why are you focused on healing? I would say, because everybody's sick. <laughs> Believe me, as soon as everybody gets well, I will quit talking about healing. <laughs> Amen? I won't waste a minute on it. So our job is to eradicate sickness and disease. Amen? Amen? Every, at least everywhere we are, everywhere we go. Yep. Amen? All right. I'm going to keep on talking and make Courtney sit down one more time. No, I'm <laughs> 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 